So we have this popular TV show, The Sex and the City, right? And I'm sure many of you have enjoyed it. Among the popular talk callers is Sex and the Brain and answer the question whether the brain has sex. Obviously not in the way that probably some of you guys might be thinking of. <laughs> it's slightly different. So this is about something that we encounter in our daily life. A topic which is hard, ignored, ignored by many, many people. The biomedical scientists, the community, the social, the lawmakers, and everybody. So when we talk about sex, what's the first thing, the first time that we encounter the word sex? When the child is born. The birth of a child is a matter of pride. It's a matter of happiness, right? And the first thing that we ask, or the first thing that we announce is, what is it, sex? Is it a boy or a girl? And this matters, because this is something that you're going to identify yourself all throughout life. This is what is going to decide what you're going to be. This is what you're going to decide your career, your profession, your way you dress up, the way you clothe up, the way you talk, the way you walk, and almost everything in your life. And this is very fundamental for our well-being. Let me take you back to your very, very old times when you were just a single cell. That one cell, when you were there in your mom's body, which was after fertilization from your father's sperm, you were a single cell, and this contained your entire genome. This contained all the information that you ever have it till today or forever in your life. And this is a genome which decides what you're going to be. And in our mother's wombs, we are going to be something like this. A single cell being present there, and it's going to be you at some point of time. As the, as the embryo develops into a mother's womb, it grows and grows and grows, and by the end of nine months, what you get would be a handsome man like this, or a beautiful woman, right? Now, what decides what is going to be a man or who's going to be a woman? It's in our chromosomes. Turns out that all males, so all of us have 46 chromosomes, with males having X and a Y chromosome, the females have X and X chromosomes. So if your father would have given you a Y chromosome, you would turn out to be 46XY, and you would develop testicles. And therefore, at birth, you'll be labeled as a man. If you have two X chromosomes, if your father gave you X chromosome, you would develop ovaries and tubes, and you would develop a woman. Simple, very, very simple science and logic. And this told us, a scientist like me, that therefore there's some information present on the sex chromosome which is going to make me decide if I'm mad or a woman, if I'm going to be a guy or a girl. Turns out, including some of my own research in my own lab and lots of research all around the world, we have found genes on the Y chromosome, which is going to act on the germs, which is going to act on the gonads, and make it into a testis. And if you do not have the Y chromosome, something else acts there and makes it into an ovary. And for years and years of research, it has been told to us that these sex chromosomes are the ones which are responsible for our reproductive system, and they're going to be responsible for functioning of our gonads. Beyond that, the sex chromosomes have no other role, and every tissue of our body, the heart, the lung, the liver, the kidney, the brain, the skin, everything is just the same. So it tells us that beyond the reproductive system, these sex chromosomes have to do nothing, and men and women seem to be equal. And this identity, what you would have it then at birth, is what you're carrying today, you're carrying throughout your life. Strange, isn't it? That split second moment, the point you were born, your doctor or your nurse said you are a boy and you were a boy for your life because the testicles were hanging out. <laughs> right? And if they weren't hanging out, you would be a girl. Now it turns out that our boys and girls are really equal. I'm sure some of you are thinking this guy is stupid. Boys and girls are not equal. Of course they are not equal. Do boys and girls think alike? No. The guys are from the Mars and the women are from the Venus. Right? Definitely, yes. The way the guys and the girls think turns out to be very different. Psychologically, we know that girls are more better at arts, more better at beauties, 
where the guys are good at rationalizing, the guys are good at math. There's several, several instances where we find lots of difference between the behavior of the guys and the girls. These are some functional MRIs, don't worry about these technical terms, where boys and girls, males and females, are put to task of navigation. All the guys, I'm sure, have craved that the girls just cannot seem to drive correctly. And here is a proof. I'm not saying this is wrong, but the reason, the areas of the brain which the guys use are very different from the areas of brains the girls use. It's not something which is problematic, but it is a fact. Language processing. As I hear, as you hear me, all the girls in the room are seeming to use two sides of the brains, whereas the guys just seem to be using one side. I'm sure the girls are happier now. <laughs> <laughs> that we are using twice the amount, and therefore now the guys should know that why the girls seem to interpret a lot of things of one little thing that you had ever said in your life. <laughs> so this tells us that guys and girls are not the same. Are the same? Probably not. When it comes to colors, perception to colors. <laughs> The girls just seem to get more colors than the guys. And I'm sure the girlfriends in this room would agree that their boyfriends just don't seem to get my fuchsia. She doesn't, he doesn't seem to get my carnation. He just calls his color pink. It seems, it turns out that guys probably can perceive only seven colors. We were wondering whether this is true. The guys have a little less perception to colors. We did a very quick survey, me and my student. We just put this on Facebook and sent it to our friends and asked them. This is a hue test. I'm sure some of you can take it when you go home. That it, it allows you to match the shades and gives you a score. The lesser the score, the more closer you are to identifying color shades. So we did about 350 participants took in this survey, about 170 girls, an equal number of boys in different age groups from across the world. And this is the score. The girls get a score very, very low, around one. But look at the guys. They get a higher score, and higher score is not a good score. That means it tells us that really the guys have a little lower perception to colors. If you ask me what were the real scores, the low, highest score ever that I got in a girl was 20. The highest score that I got in a guy was 75. So you can imagine it's equal difference. So why these things are there? So this definitely tells me that guys and girls don't to be the same in terms of their brain capacities, in terms of their brain thinking. Now what? So I was very excited and intrigued by this idea that why are these guys and girls different? So I was talking to my friends who are neurologists, psychologists, neurobiologists, that are there any real differences between the brains of boys and girls? And they would say, huh, we don't know. Then I would give them these fancy examples, and they would say, probably yes, and it would be largely because of the way they are brought up. It's social priming. Because girls get more colorful toys and clothes to wear, they get more colorful, color-oriented. And the poor guys have blues and blacks and grays, so they have less perception to colors. I was like, is it true? Is it social priming? So we did a quick survey. My student who is here, Varun, who did this experiment, where uh, we took mice. We said that, OK, these poor animals don't have clothes to wear, and there is very little social priming that they undergo. Are there any differences in the brains of mice? And it turns out, yes. Look at this graph. The pink are the colors for the female mice. And you can see these proteins, the proteins which are required to make the stem cells in the brain, are far higher in the female mice as compared to male mice. Even the proteins which are responsible for making your neurons, they're slightly higher in the female mice than the male mice. And even the estrogen receptor, which is required for the estrogen priming of the brain, and that was high. So we got excited further. And we said, hey, look, now I have a experimental data to tell you that the, the brains of mice and males and females are different. So my friend said that, ah, oh, you can see there is this hormone receptor which is different, and all these differences are because of hormones. Because the girls make a lot of estrogen, and the boys don't make estrogen, they make more of testosterone, so all this brain priming is because of hormones. So I told Varun that, okay, let's do something else, and let's take the brains of babies which are in the fetuses, which are in the fetus stage when the babies are growing in the mouse embryos, what we call them. 
and we find the same difference. This is a point when the, there are no hormones in the, in the baby's body, and you can see that yet there are phenomenal differences in the protein contents of the brains of the female babies and the male babies. This is exciting because now we can tell people that it is not just social priming or hormonal priming, which is going to decide what is happening in the brain, but the brain is already becoming sex biased. Even when the baby is growing, it is deciding what is it wanting to become. It's going to become like a boy like a brain or a girl like a brain. And this you can see it evidence from here that there are many, many proteins higher in the brain of the girls. If I said that the brains were same, I should have seen same amounts of proteins. But the fact that I don't implies that, yes, the fundamental differences in the brains of the guys and girls right from when we are developing, right when the brain is wiring, right when the neurons are making connections, there seems to be major differences differences between the boys and the girls. Now, in biology, I'm a developmental biologist, and we try to see how the gonads are, gonads are made. And I'm told, and we know for years and years of research in humans and many, many animal species, that whether you are XX or XY, I told you that XYs would make testicles, but whether you are XX or XY, the region which is going to make your gonad is bipotential. That means whether your chromosomal sex is whatever, your gonad has to decide what it wants to become. It could become either a testis or an ovary. So now what we propose is that like the gonad, where we call it a sex determination of the gonad, there could be a possibility of sex determination of the brain right at the time of development. When you're developing, your gonad is deciding whether it wants to make ovaries or testis. And the brain is also deciding whether it wants to become a male brain or a female brain. And eventually, after you are born, when the hormones come and when the social priming comes in, the brain starts making more male-like or more female-like. Now, this becomes phenomenal. This becomes very, very interesting. Why? We know of something called as alternate sexual preferences, the homosexuals, the transgenders. It is quite possible that the gonad would have decided to become the testicles, but the brain decided to become like a female brain. The gonad might have decided to become an ovary, and the male priming happened, and the brain happened like the males. And you would now get a transgender. If parts of brains had taken different decisions, some part would have taken a male-like decision, some part would have taken a female-like decision, and you might get a bisexual. And furthermore, you may get a homosexual similarly, because depending on the amounts of priming that might have occurred in different regions of the brain, because remember, brain is not a homogeneous organ, there are different sectors in the brain, and each part of the brain might have its ability to decide its own sex. So this perfectly is incongruent with the story of Ardhanareshwar, which in Hindu mythology we have heard, where you have equal feminine and masculine powers. So probably in the brain, there are feminine and masculine powers, like the yin and the yang, which would keep in different quantities in the brain. And probably different parts of the brain might be able to take different decisions. And the decision, not necessarily, should be the one like your gonads. It could be different from your external appearances. It could be different from your gonadal decisions. Now, this definitely explains the entire spectrum of alternate sexual preferences. I'm told that there are about 48 types of sexual preferences that one would encounter. And if we now imagine that the brain has a power to decide its sex, you would explain a lot of these characteristics. And this has more implications. This has more widespread implications in the white social life. We must now recognize that probably the brain has a power to decide its own sex. And the sex which has been assigned to us at birth may not be the one which we are expected to follow. Legally, we have our system which is gender bias. We have laws different for males and females. And these are exclusively based on my external appearances and not what my brain is about to think. Our education system is also gender biased. It tells us that boys have to do certain things and girls have to do certain things. Are we right in doing that? Talking about toilets. Somebody who could be having an alternate sexual preference, or maybe thinking by the brain, the thought process in his brain, which tells him you are a male or a female, might have taken a different decision from his gonads, from his external appearance. And this person would not be very comfortable going to a male toilet 
if he's looking like a male, but we want to go to a female toilet and cannot go because of the social status that we have. So are we right in just assigning the gender right at birth? It is you who will make a change. Start thinking about yourself. Sexuality is not just about what you like of a physical person in the, for the opposite sex. Sexuality can rise in your driving skills, your perception to colors, the way you approach to somebody, the way you study, the way you want to take professions. And because different regions of the brains have different abilities, it is quite likely that for certain parts of your brain might have taken a decision to take, become boy-like. Certain parts of your brain might have taken a decision to be a girl-like. Ask yourself, what are my sexual identities, not just in terms of your external appearances or your wanting to sleep with somebody, but rather ask yourself, what are my identities individual, as an individual? And once you start with that, you have many, many more avenues. You need to think about your friends. You need to think about people who have this and treat them that way. You should not be treating people the way they look externally, but the way they should be thinking in that particular direction. It is you who would make a change. It is you who will have to decide that what is your brain sex and what is the brain sex of the people that you are around it and make everybody comfortable. At some point in life, I would like to see this day that when you have and you see a mother with a baby and if you're, if you're asking whether it's a boy or a girl, the answer should be, I do not know. It's too early to decide. Let that individual decide what he or she wants to be. Thank you.